on the shift. I am so excited to uh, start this new era of shift TV. Um, God has done so much and I'm really ready to unpack it all. And I have a very special guest today, my ministry partner, Minister Kadesh of the Stream Ministries, um, also founder and CEO of the Wellspring Group and the Wishing Well, which we'll be talking about very soon because God is birthing all the things. Um, but today we have one important question, which is, how are you really? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. I, I honestly had a moment uh, last year where I realized that I was not okay. I was not okay. And I didn't understand what I was feeling um, until I started therapy. Um, and from that moment, it was honestly just the spiritual journey of God bringing me back to him because I didn't even realize that I was disconnected from myself. Mm. And so I am so happy that you decided to put language to what many people may be feeling as well. And I think that we all realize that we need a collective pause right now. Like we really do. If we just sit and think about what we've been through just in the past four years, not even just our whole lives, right? Like our whole lives on top of the past four years. So, and I really think this book is going to bring the soul healing that people really need. So welcome, Kadesh. Welcome back, actually. <laughs> to this, uh, the new era of Shift TV. I'm so happy to be here, as you already know. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Candice. Uh, and again, it's with a tremendous heart of gratitude that I'm here to even talk about this new work, uh, this new yeah. piece, this new evolution of what I think is a book that is really dedicated to the spirit of, of humanity and the spirit of people um, in the world, in the face of the world, of everything that we are demanded, <laughs> everything we're being called to do, um, everything yes. that we are being demanded of from each other. So thank you so very much. And thank you for the kind introduction. <laughs> of course. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you. You've been by my side through a lot. <laughs> a lot of everything. Um, and I'm so grateful that God brought you into my life. And um, I'm excited to kind of introduce this book. Um, you just you just released it. So congratulations. <laughs> yes. um, I'm excited for all of you to go ahead and dive in. The link is right in the description. Um, this book is an invitation to pause to look within and ask the hard questions. How am I really doing? What am I holding on to that no longer serves me? And how can I move forward in a way that aligns with my values and humanity? Um, we have to remember that we're human at the end of the day, right? Like <laughs> I had to come to a point where I'm like, you know what? I can do all the things, I can have all the accomplishments, but I'm still human and I still have to really just reconnect with myself and understand how am I really doing? <laughs> so I just want to read um, I just want to read your dedication in the beginning because I think it really opens this conversation in a very real way. So you, you stated to all of humanity, this book is dedicated to your courage resilience and unyielding spirit in the face of a world that constantly demands more. May these pages remind you that being truly seen and heard is not only a human right, but an act of self-liberation. Let this be your guide to reclaiming the unmasked, deeply human version of yourself. Together we can create a ripple of 
connection and authenticity that transcends the noise, bringing us closer to the simplicity, love, and unity that we all desire. Here's to a future where how are you becomes not just a question, but an invitation to be real, vulnerable, and undoubtedly alive. Wow. Mm. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> Tell us the genesis of the inspiration of what led you to put these words to paper and really reach people in a real human way. Yeah, so thank you. And thanks for reading, uh, reading the dedication. You know, the dedication to the book came after the book was finished. <laughs> so the dedication mm. came after writing um, all of the chapters of the book. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there have been so many times in the last, I would say decade or so, as we look back on this last decade of our lives, this last decade mm -hmm. of our socio-political, economic, spiritual world. And I have found that it has been our human nature to ask the question, how are you? Right. Or, mm -hmm. you know, let's use the church term, like, you know, how you doing? Blessed and highly right. favored, right? Blessed <laughs> that and is, highly favored. <laughs> um, exactly. It's like a general social script that we have yeah. conformed to. A, a general <laughs> social script of I'm fine. Um, I'm doing well. I'm okay. But what I have found is that, particularly in my work in both organizational development and ministry, is that people have been masking the actual response to how I'm doing. The title mm -hmm. of the book, when I initially started the book, and again, this book was birthed out of a conversation that we had, you, myself, and Andrea, our mm -hmm. other ministry partner, about the times that we were in. And I was praying mm -hmm. about what God really wanted me to write about. I've written many things, but I was praying and I said, well, what is it that is important? And, and and I heard the question very clearly, well, how, how are you doing, daughter? <laughs> how are you doing? Mm. And I'm like, well, you know, I got, I got this going on. Uh, um, I have this happening. I, I have family. I have my children. I have my husband. I have my profession. Mm. And I started listing every single thing except for how I was doing. Mm. I started to list my tasks, my responsibilities, the things that I needed to do, the demands that were on me, the deadlines I had. And never once did I say, Kadesh, I'm fine. Kadesh, I'm not so fine. And so the mm -hmm. book, the title is, is how are you? How are you really? <laughs> right? How are you so really? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Right. If, if you could really listen to someone when someone asks, how are you and and get a gauge and say, uh, you don't sound well, you, you don't seem mm -hmm. well beyond the fire and then really ask and dig in. How are you really doing and get people's answers? That's where the book was birthed from. You see, the thing that we have had to deal with is this culture of, you know, toxic positivity or this culture of masking or the expectations of an answer, a culture mm -hmm. of perfection, a culture of everything is okay, even when we're anything but okay. And so mm -hmm. we have been, what I have found um, in my work, especially in ministry and in, in, in human resources and organization development, is that people continue to push down the discomfort, push down mm -hmm. the trauma, push down mm -hmm. the pain, ignoring the quiet noise inside of yourself mm -hmm. that is saying, mm -hmm. hey, knock, knock, hey, something right. isn't, isn't well. And so the book was really birthed out of an honest answer to a question um, that I was forced to ask myself. And as the book goes on, I was actually forced to answer this question, how am I doing with every single chapter? It, the book mm -hmm. escalated from chapter to chapter where yeah. I was really being challenged to respond in the authentic way that I was asking readers to respond um, mm -hmm. and the, the vulnerable way in which I was asking readers to embrace the context of the book. Yeah, 
Yeah, I love it because, you know, we're not taught to be vulnerable, right? We're really not. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of times, like we've grown up in environments where we were not able to be vulnerable. So we don't Mm -hmm. even know how, you know, we don't know how. And what I realized um, in this process of me facing myself um, is to understand like the root of of the internal brokenness that causes you to not be okay, right? Because that is the load that we end up carrying internally on top of our external loads, right? <laughs> so I love that this book now um, helps us to focus within now. Um, And actually December, um, the month of December was the time that I intentionally chose to take a sabbatical from my business in 2015 to just sit with God. And that's actually how the shift was birthed. So Mm -hmm. I always see December as a time to you know, take that soul sabbatical and just sit with yourself, sit with God, reflect and review the year, et cetera. And um, one phrase that I, I love that you use was tending to your garden, right? Yes. How do you start tending to your garden? And I love that term um, and because I, I firmly believe every... God has placed in every one of us gifts, skills, talents, things to cultivate, right? Um, But, you know, based on society, we kind of get pushed into the, you know, traditional timing structure of things, you know, go to college, get a job, do this, do that, right? (laughs) So how do you start to tend to your garden and like tend to the things that um, really help to, you know, cultivate your your well-being and to cultivate you at the end of the day, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. That is such a good question, um, Candice. And I, I like, you know, your reference to the, you're going to go to college, you're going to go mm-hmm. to this, you're going to go to that. Mm-hmm. Um, we are in a culture of haste. Go, 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 yes. go. Um, You started um, this interview by saying it's time for a collective pause. Mm -hmm. It's not just the individual pause. It's the collective pause. It's the pause that is necessary to replenish a garden. Mm -hmm. Um, Think about a garden. And, you know, Chris, my husband uh, loves to garden. And Mm -hmm. when he got into gardening, he did a lot of detailed exploration on, you know, the soil and the time that it takes for different uh, plants Mm -hmm. and fruits and vegetables to grow, what you could grow together, what Mm -hmm. you needed to do over the course of the the soil. And there was something very interesting that uh, happened after our first year of having the garden. When the season was over, because we're in New England and, you know, winter, winter's mm-hmm. on its way, um, I just thought, okay, great. You know, whatever vegetables are there in the garden now, they would just, you know, die off. And then next year they'll grow back. Mm-hmm. What Rick did was interesting. He tended to the soil when the season was over. Mm-hmm. He tended to soil, he said, you know, you have to turn the soil over. He had Mm -hmm. to add clovers to the soil. So when the soil was no longer producing the vegetable and the fruit, he still tended to the soil. Mm -hmm. What we tend to do in our world and in our culture and in cultures globally is we continue to go, 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 go. And then there is no time to replenish the soil. There's Mm -hmm. no time See if the soil needs more fertilizer. And there's no time to see what is necessary for the growth of the next season. I love that you say Mm -hmm. you take December to reflect, to pause, and to plan Mm -hmm. for, to tend to the soil. What I have found in this book, too, is that we are always saying, I'm fine, right? We, we say, I'm fine. And, and the truth is, what happens when the old soil or fine is really not fine any longer? 
Okay. That's right. the moment when we have to pause and listen to that small voice that's saying enough is enough in this moment. Um, if you don't have those moments of, of brave courage and vulnerability where you can start to listen to yourself, the whisper will become a shout. <laughs> yeah. And the shout Ooh. will become chaos, and then the chaos will become distraction, and then find mm -hmm. then it's a place where what is a small wound, right? Something from a childhood, something from a previous relationships, then becomes something that is so gasping and so open that it becomes mm -hmm. very difficult to heal. And so what I'm finding is that we're dealing in in business and with people that are are working on gaping wounds, wounds that are mm -hmm. bleeding out because we don't take the time to say, maybe I'm not healed. Maybe fine really is not fine. So what we're really looking at is that we need to take the ability to not just pause, but also to stop, to stop to exhale, yes. to be honest, uh, you are in the process of thinking and processing and responding. We as human beings, we need time to really process, to ask ourselves those questions where we're hearing a real response. If we're yes. constantly going, if we're constantly moving, that doesn't give us the time to dig deeper, to answer the really tough questions on, am I really hurting here? Do I need support here? Do I need help here? It's the time that we need to deal with the messiness of life, the messiness of our backgrounds and the messiness of where we've been so that we can move forward in a pure, clean, healthy legacy. And when fine mm -hmm. is not fine, <laughs> you mm -hmm. find that you are responding in anger. You respond in pain. You respond by carrying a weight of burdens that people don't even understand that you're carrying. Exactly. You know, have you ever had a conversation with a broken person where you might mm -hmm. say something like, I love you. And then the response that they give back to you is, you don't love me. How could you love me if, and all you're thinking in your mind is, well, what did I say beyond I love you that is making you process what I'm saying so differently? That is when you experience a person that's actually not fine, that's really not doing well, that is responding from the core of their soul's traumas and the core of their soul's brokenness. And then you get and that's what we're getting now. The person at the grocery store, the person yeah. you know, yeah. in your church where you're like, why is Sally so mean? <laughs> right. Why is Mary so messy? Why is Paul mm -hmm. so angry? Right? Mm -hmm. Because we don't understand that. And sometimes we have to ask those questions of ourselves. Yes. When you respond as well in that way, what is mm -hmm. that what am I holding on to that is making me speak out of my mouth what is really in my heart and my soul? Right. And so the pause in the garden, the tending to the garden is really tending to the fruit and tending to the, 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 the uh, flowers that will bloom as a result of taking the time to pause and to collect mm -hmm. what no longer serves us in the garden either. Part of the tending of the garden that Chris describes is actually the rooting out of weeds that yes. come in during the summer. Like the yes. seeds of weeds that would come in, you got to tend, you got to pull, you got to prune, you got to mm -hmm. understand how to show up for your garden, for your soil, for yourself. Because then yes. you face this space where you're no longer being transformed and you're closing the door to transformation because of your unwillingness to take the time to discover mm -hmm. a little bit more about yourself. Exactly, and I don't want yeah. to, no one wants to close door to transformation. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. And you know, what it really provokes are our triggers, right? Like, and it's signs of unhealed trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and cause that's the thing that's ultimately coming out, right? Yes. Um, and I, um, when I looked in my journal around this time, um, a couple weeks ago, um, one of the titles was um, Uprooting. Uprooting, it was a time of uprooting every dormant thing. Mm -hmm. 
So the things mm-hmm. that are lying dormant, right, in your soul, in your heart, in your spirit that you've just pushed down, right? Because sometimes, you know, we all have ways that we respond, you know, to pain, right? So we push it down, we disconnect, we disassociate, but it doesn't mean that it's not still there, right? So Mm -hmm. that's part of this process, the uprooting, right, is, you know, dealing with um, unhealed traumas. Um, And a lot of it is rooted in our childhood wounds too, right? So what makes this so hard is that you do truly have to face yourself and face that pain, right? Like a lot of times it's hard to, and well, let me, let me just give ourselves some grace too. A lot of times we don't even have the luxury to do it, right? Mm. We don't have the time, the space, the energy to, because of everything demanded of us, right? Like, that's honestly the reason we keep going, going, going is because, you know, of, of the demands and, and really us being in survival mode. I can honestly say I've, I've been in survival mode for a long time. So the shift really is about coming out of survival mode, too. But I want to talk about um, identifying our triggers um, because you you address this in the book as well. And uh, one of the passages I wanted to share Um, was that um, you say that because so many people don't acknowledge the difference between their conscious and subconscious minds, triggers like ghosts can present themselves at any time. When the trigger is closely related to our past trauma, the feelings that may come make us uncomfortable and confused. We may try to push past these feelings, but that's not always possible because they're so uncomfortable. We can't get on with what we want to do. (laughs) And I felt so seen, Kadesh, (laughs) first of all. Um, And I know many will too, because again, it's like we, we rarely have the time to deal with the things that we experience. So how do we start to identify our triggers and our traumas, you know, before they're even provoked, you know, before we even cause that, you know, that door to transformation to close because we're reacting, right? We, I think that many can relate that we tend to have a lot of emotional reactions to things without truly understanding like subconsciously what's driving it. Well, thank you for sharing that, Candice. And, um, you know, when I was writing that um, that particular chapter, I was uh, referring back to a, 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 a recovery home that I had worked in um, as a mm-hmm. uh, just an advisor, trauma advisor. And Uh, they had this saying (laughs) around uh, fine, an acronym for fine, you know, that was like fine, it was a a saying that really alluded to not being fine. And Mm -hmm. what you would find in those spaces was, and this were spaces of trauma recovery and recovery from addiction was because those individuals were had given themselves the opportunity and had said yes. They said yes to changing their triggers or behaviors that led them to the space where they were, you know, addicted to various substances. You could mm-hmm. see people having these conversations with themselves and with each other around what triggers were and how to identify them and how to move beyond them. The thing about triggers that I find interesting and the thing that I have also found interesting about um, awareness, both conscious and subconscious, is we have to conduct a personal assessment. We have to conduct a personal check-in first because the thing about our earliest memories and some of our earliest behaviors is that part of a trauma response could be forgetting, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. The suppression Mm -hmm. of those memories, 
the suppression of that pain, the hiding from that particular thing until you're triggered by the behavior of someone else. And you might be asking yourself, well, why did that trigger me? Why is it that when they say these things, I am brought back to a place of trauma and pain? Start with a personal check-in. And nice. this is not something that requires an hour a day or, you know, five hours a day. It just starts with five minutes in your morning to say, how am I feeling today? And nice. it's important. I love that you share your journal, Candice, like what mm -hmm. your journal uh, shared, what you wrote in your journal last year, because you can write these things down. You can write down, well, how am I doing today? What are the things that are on my mind? What are the things that I'm thinking about? Also, you have to build emotional awareness. You mm -hmm. have to be able to identify what emotion you're feeling well, when. Uh, yeah. The last time we were on Shift TV, um, we, we uh, had an emotional wheel. And yes. I understanding emotions to be like the top five, sadness, happiness, joy. There were like 90 different ways that we experienced such a emotion. Spectrum, right? <laughs> exactly. mm -hmm. There were so many emotions to how we experience emotions. So even getting an emotion, emotional wheel to identify, well, how am I feeling? Building the mm -hmm. emotional awareness and then practice honesty in communication. Yes. What I found as well is, when you are holding back the resentment, when you hold back your lack of vulnerability, what you mm -hmm. find is that your responses then become heightened because after 10 times saying I'm fine, after a trigger that has been, um, you know, an area of, of vulnerability that has been triggered in you, eventually you, you will explode. You'll explode on the person, the circumstance, the place. And so it's important that you do not keep that pain hidden or that trauma hidden for so long that before you know it, you become an explosive time bomb just waiting to blow up on the next person that simply just asks you, how are things today? Or says something, gives you feedback about your work or your performance. It gives you feedback on something related to your family life. And it's a trauma, a traumatic response for you. And then a trigger that you then explode on the person that receives that. And then yeah. it's really important as well to develop support systems. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Support systems. I can't tell you how often people, when they feel like, uh, you know, again, in these last four years or so, there's been a culture of isolation, both by the nature of the environment that we've been in, and also by the rapid increases in um, technological advancements, right? Mm -hmm. You find people becoming more isolated people becoming more separated from community. There are tons of uh, Harvard business studies that talk about longevity in life coming from the fact that you have community, that you have a support system. You have people that you can talk to, people that you can be honest with about your feelings and how you're doing. So it's important that you share um, and have a support structure that you can share, not just with the singular person, me, Kadesh, when I say I'm not fine, I'm just saying it to myself. It's yeah. also important that I have to share that with because support yeah. groups can discuss or support structures can start to help you talk through those emotions. I'm a big yeah. fan of therapy. And so I'm glad that you shared, um, you know, that you started, you know, talking with a therapist and the therapist helped you to explore finding a spiritual community, a community mm -hmm. um, where you can talk to people about how you're really doing. Uh, when you and I and, and, and Andrea, when mm -hmm. we get together as ministers, partners. Uh, if I am not doing well, I will tell y'all that morning when we're going to pray, listen, I need you all to pray for me in this area. Mm -hmm. And when mm -hmm. you pray and when we come together in community, that's when we start to understand and feel, oh, why does this, it, I understand in what you're saying, why this triggers me. So it's right. a constant iterative process of rediscovering an emotion and dealing through the trauma of that emotion. You have to think how often 
we have spent suppressing that trauma, how many years we spent hiding the feelings that keep us um, apart and isolated from others. It's not just something that we can just solve in one instance or in one moment. It's a thing that we have to practice over and over again. It's a reconstruction of our thinking. It's a reconstruction mm -hmm. of our feeling. It's a construction of our soul. It's a reconstruction of everything that we are so that we can get back to the true resource of our energy, which is goodness, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. goodness, kindness, it is mm -hmm. love. That's the resource of our energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, we've gotten to a space where the resources of our energy have been in the emotions that come with anger and pain and suffering. And what we're seeing is a world that is resourced by that kind of energy. So we have Ooh. to set that time aside. Yeah. Yes, that is mm -hmm. so real. Yeah, I truly learned the importance of needing a safe space, um, needing someone that you can be vulnerable with, and being able to freely express yourself, however you're feeling. Right. Like um, and, and speaking of my journal um, around my birthday, my birthday um, in 2021, my soul's desire was the to be the fullest expression of myself. Mm -hmm. Meaning like there were ways that I felt like I couldn't yet fully express myself and I'm not going to get emotional, <laughs> but I truly learned the importance of having a safe space to open up and just to express whatever you're feeling, whatever it is, you know? Um, and I just want to do a shameless plug for the stream. Um, being a virtual church, a spiritual community where people can gather from all over the world um, and not feel like, you know, you're in a big church and no one knows you, but you're actually in a, a community where you can just freely be. I think that's what I think that's what our souls are needing, just space to just be. Right? Cuz we're always the expectation of us always is to produce. So we're just keeping it together, you know, so we can produce. But sometimes your soul just needs to cry. Right? Sometimes yes. you just need to open up, right? So I encourage everyone to join the stream, number one, <laughs> but to, to build your support system, right? Like you said, um, that support system, again, even if it's just one person, right? Being able to open up is so critical right now because God doesn't want you to hold on to those things right? It's those things that, those subconscious things, you know, that end up affecting our health truly, right? Because I also yeah. did some um, reading on how this affects our nervous system too, right? When you're holding on yes. to anxiety, yes. fear, pain, like it affects your nervous system and that throws your whole body off, right? That and that is truly mm -hmm. the root of the chronic diseases that um, have been prevalent in our community, right? Because we're holding exactly. on to anger, yeah. right? We're holding on to resentment, you know, we're we're holding on to just words unspoken, right? Like all the things. So so yes, yeah, just I just I I pray that God just blesses everyone with that that space to truly be free, right? Because mm -hmm. that's what we're ultimately that's where this is ultimately leading us to, right? Is that self liberation, right? Where you're yes. no longer living in that internal prison, right? That internal um, closed off, isolated space. God is like, no, mm -mm. open up, mm -hmm. come back to me, right? Come to yeah. me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, bring your burdens for I will give you rest, right? So I feel like the Lord is calling us into his rest, 
right? To just rest in yes. him, no longer afraid, no longer worried about anything. Just sit with me, right? Just sit with me and just talk about everything you're going through. Like you said, you you sat with God and he's like, well, how are you doing really? <laughs> how are you? How are you? First of all, how are you? And I can truly say, what I can truly say, what I learned this year is that God really cares about us. Yes. Like you're bringing him your to-do list. You're bringing him all the things you need. You're bringing your breakthroughs, but he really cares about you at the end of the day. And that just brought my soul just so much peace just off of that alone, you know, that yes. he heard my cry, like he heard me, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> so yes. I, I feel like everyone will have that experience um, as well. Um, two more things I wanna touch on um, as we close this out is I wanna acknowledge that you are also a phenomenal um, human resource transformational leader, right? You're, <laughs> uh, I, I love the fact that you have launched um, global well-being initiatives because I'm also wondering for those of us who are leaders, right? How do we check on our people that we're leading, right? The people in our organizations. How can we ask them this question too and, and have a vulnerable space? For them, I'm curious of of how you're thinking about you know bringing this element of well being into the workplace too. Yeah, wow, great question. Um, you know, one of our uh, taglines and one of our phrases for our business Wellspring Group, which is a HR business partner consultancy that brings the human back into resources into human resources. Um, is who cares for the people that care for cares for the people? Who mm. is caring for our leaders? And who are asking our leaders the tough questions? You know, one of the scriptures I love in the Bible, it's like, pray for your leaders, right? Yes. Pray for the, the, the burden that they carry. Pray for the responsibility. And I recently wrote an article, um, I'm actually going to put, put it on my LinkedIn, uh, called Great Leaders Cry. Right. Yes. And it really spoke about the level of emotional vulnerability that it takes for leaders to express themselves because leaders are often carrying the burdens of an entire organization and the responsibility of an entire organization. Uh, the birthing of the dimensions of well being. So we came up with a um, a methodology called the nine dimensions of well-being, which focus on spiritual, physical, financial, educational, vocational well-being in organizations, um, was birthed out of the, the thought that every person carries different layers of things that make them feel well right? There are things that make you feel well, like needing to feel loved or family or a pursuit of your career or the pursuit of, of education or having financial stability um, is something that makes people feel well. So there are different layers of wellness that we need to explore. It's like an onion. You got to peel off the layers. And so yeah. in our work, found that you cannot just answer the question the same for everyone. Also considering the love languages, like all of us have different ways of having, you know, experiencing love. Like my number one love language is like acts of service. Chris's love language is like physical touch and words of affirmation. Now those are like on the lower side of my scale. However, <laughs> <laughs> however, um, I have intentional about mm -hmm. loving him in that way so that he mm -hmm. experiences love in the way that he needs to experience it. Uh, love languages are the same way in organizations. It's the same way in your family. It's in the same way in your personal yeah. relationships, whether it's a spousal relationship or a friendship. It's that it's important that we acknowledge how people feel valued, right? Yeah. I can't tell you the number 
times where I've been in conversations with uh, people that I've worked with or organizations that we've consulted with. And, you know, you may have an idea about what they want for the organization to feel transformed. And they're like, no, I actually want my people to be paid more. I need them to be compensated mm -hmm. more. And so you can mm -hmm. see that some of their love languages are coming out in the way that they lead. Same thing in relationships. Like if I come home and the kitchen is clean, okay? <laughs> Let me tell you. Simple and things. the kitchen is clean, okay? You couldn't, <laughs> it's like the house is, is, is Christmas time every day for the next two weeks, right? It's the holidays for the next two weeks. So again, it's really important that we understand there's different and unique ways in which people experience well-being. And being able to identify that in your organization, in your families. And by the way, your family is an organization, okay? Your family is an organization as well. Okay, mm -hmm. your home is an organization. All right. The same way that you, you know, have a performance review in the organization is the same way you should think about it in your home. The same way that you have goals is the same way you should think about it in your home. So the same methodology mm -hmm. around the dimensions of well-being that you practice in your personal relationships as leaders, you should practice as a leader. I also mm -hmm. would recommend, again, for leaders, it's really important for leaders to have support structures. You often hear leaders say, oh, it's isolating at the top. It's lonely up here. I have no one to talk to. Well, there are thousands of companies that have leaders. So if everyone is saying the same thing, there needs to be support groups as well or leadership um, right. you know, incubators as well that are just saying to leaders, how are you doing? How is your organization doing? How are yeah. your people doing? Mm -hmm. Where you just come and it's a on how to develop the empathy and character necessary to develop your people. You can always yeah. talk about the bottom line, you can always talk about revenue drivers, you can always talk about this. However, people drive the body of your organizations. So being mm -hmm. able to be aware, being able to be tuned in and tapped in to the culture of your organization where people feel seen. You said, Candace, mm -hmm. earlier when you read it, you know, I felt seen in this. People in your organizations need to feel seen and they need to feel heard. Uh, most yes. of the times whenever I'm talking to someone and they say, you know, I felt valued at work. It's that they say, oh, my manager heard me. They saw me. Yeah. And what does that mean to see or hear someone? It means you have to authentically dig deeper into understanding the identity of those people that you work with. And the same for yourself as a leader. Find a group, find an incubator, find a think tank, find thought partners that you can talk through. Because the more you talk, the more you talk about how it feels to be cared for as a leader, the more you realize that there are commonalities that you experience in leadership that actually make you more common and similar with other leaders than different and isolated. The isolation comes from the fact that we separate ourselves. Mm. We do. Yeah. Yeah, we do. And mm -hmm. not even realizing mm -hmm. that's kind of like our nature. Um, and yeah, mm -hmm. and remembering that, you know, people are humans at the end of the day. Like, yes, they're running our businesses. Yes, they're doing all the things, but, you know, they're humans, too, you know, going through their own life experiences as well. So I love this as like a, a weekly check in, you know, like, <laughs> yes. yes. How are you really, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I think that will bring, yes, bring the culture of being yeah. seen, you know, into the workplace too. So I love you know, this. As a, as a <laughs> yeah. As a result of this, we actually started an inbox called, how mm -hmm. are you for real for leaders? Where yes. we're just like, email us, <laughs> email us, let mm -hmm. us know how you are. Have you ever been in a situation as a leader where you just wish you could close your door and just say, oh my gosh, I wish I could get some advice wow. right now, or I wish I could just say, this was frustrating, this setback was challenging, this right. person I'm working with is making it a little bit difficult for us to meet our goals, just a moment. So we created mm -hmm. an inbox specifically for just Oh, I love that. Like, so can people, okay, so people can email yeah. it or how does it work? 
Yes, people okay. can email it. Actually, I'm going to, you can, it's actually the, our website, I think Wellspring, I don't know if I could put it in the chat, but it's just yes, www.thinkwellspring.com. I will add that link, yes. yeah, for leaders so that leaders can have a safe place to go to, right? Because, yeah, the yeah. pressure is yeah. tough. You know, the pressure is tough, you know? So, yes, again, it's bringing the human humanity <laughs> back into our world, right? Because, again, it's just the way this world has been structured is just it has really disregarded our souls, honestly, you know? So I love bringing, being heart centered, um, understanding, you know, well-being is a, a strength to develop, right? Um, in the midst of all the things. And sometimes you do need to shift, right? Like, don't be afraid to shift. Because sometimes like we're constantly feeling these things because you know, where we're still in a mode that um, is is not fulfilling us, right? Whatever, whatever it may be. Um, so we can't be afraid to shift. I, that was honestly my aha moment um, when I decided to shift was, oh, I can't continue operating this way. Mm. So yeah. it's okay. It is okay. And it's okay. So I hope that frees someone. <laughs> um, and the, the last question I wanted to ask was, how do we answer, what are some examples of how do we answer the question, how are you? Instead <laughs> of just the automated response, I'm fine. What are some other examples of things that we can say so that we can start being honest with ourselves, even at different levels of vulnerability? What are some other answers that can <laughs> help us? That is such a great question. And the answer I'm going to give is the answer that came at uh, the conclusion of this book. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> in being honest and vulnerable with the book, I started the book um, as you know I shared earlier because I was being asked of myself how was I doing in the context of my life, parenting, wife, business, entrepreneur, ministry leader, and you know, listening to other people and wondering, you know, hearing people say they were fine, but then understanding that underneath they weren't. And when I came to the end of the journey of the book, the, the final chapter I had written was the importance of honesty. Mm -hmm. right? That was the last chapter. Mm -hmm. and, and in saying that, the question, the way to answer the question is what is honest for you in that moment. Mm -hmm. I love that. It's what's honest for you at the moment that the question is being asked. It's what's honest for what is happening in your internal world at that moment. Mm -hmm. It's what's honest for what is happening in your struggles or in your joys. It's the courage to be brave and to practice honesty and intentionality at a moment that may feel like you should not do that, a moment feel like you should not be vulnerable. Um, it's a moment where you start to be revolutionary in your honesty. Mm -hmm. you start to revolt against the conformity of what you've been used to. You start mm -hmm. to say, really, how am I doing? So it's mm -hmm. the courage, the courage, mm -hmm. the perfect answer, the right answer, is the courageous answer for anyone that's listening. It's yeah. what feels courageous for you in that moment and understanding that it's okay to be courageous in your answer. It's okay yes. for the question to become real for you. Yes. And I share that because I finished the book with being honest. And in the book, mm -hmm. there are these tools, these strategies, these seven steps to well-being, the the mm -hmm. ways of vulnerability. I give 
tricks and tips and strategies on being able to answer the question. And I was done with the book, cover done, content done, ready to release. Uh, this was almost eight weeks ago now, ready to release. Mm -hmm. And the morning after, and I'm just going to read the first paragraph of the of the afterword for you all to understand why I answered the question through the lens of courage and honesty. The morning after, um, when I completed the book, and I'll just read the first paragraph. Mm -hmm. Life asked me the very question that I had spent so much time urging others to consider. How are you really? It was 6 a.m. when my daughter burst into our bedroom. Her face was pale and her voice shaking. Mom, something is wrong with Adani, she said. Her eyes filled with tears, breathless, her words terrified. An instinct took over and my husband, Chris and I bolted from the bedroom and raced down the hall to my eldest son's room. The scene that awaited us was one that no parent was ever prepared for. Adani's body was convulsing on control of beat, his face pale, his lips tinged with blood. His breathing was shallow and uneven, and it was a dreadful confirmation for us that something was ter terribly wrong. Time seemed to stretch and collapse all at the same time as we sprang into action. I straddled Adani, Chris grabbed my phone and called 911 and we relayed the urgency of the situation. With a shaky voice, I said, Adani, son, stay with us. I put my hands on him, trembling, praying, steadily trying to keep him steady from shaking and from injuring himself. And I kept saying, stay with us, as if the sound of our voices alone could anchor him to us and could will him back to wherever he had gone. What I later found is that seizures were violent, chaotic disruptions of the mind. Adani mm -hmm. is okay now. I finished, you know, there's more to the afterward. Mm -hmm. But I'm grateful that you asked me that question because mm -hmm. that is the nature of life and the nature of God is that we will sometimes be put into a test that challenges us to respond to the very thing that he is asking for us to stretch in, to develop in the area of really being honest and transparent and true with ourselves. So at yeah. the moment when I was done with this book, at the moment where I felt like I had all the boxes checked and I knew exactly mm -hmm. how to respond to I'm fine, life threw me something else that then mm -hmm. challenged me to give the honest answers. I was angry. I was hurt. I was confused. Mm -hmm. I had gone 23 years with four children and none of them ever having a cold to this moment where I was trying to wake my son up from a seizure. And in that moment, I had to answer the question for myself with courage and vulnerability and not just for myself with those that were around me. And so yeah. the best thing, the best tool that this book can provide for you, though there's strategies on mindfulness, strategies on getting community, is the strategy mm -hmm. to be honest and vulnerable with yourself. The mm -hmm. one that forces you to answer the question, how are you really doing with intentionality and vulnerability and courage, no matter what the circumstances. And I can tell you from the responses that I received from people when I said I wasn't fine, when I received from people when I said I was not well, when I cried in the middle of meetings, when I broke down in the middle of the hallway, when I started to think back to the memory of, of Adani next to me and, and those traumas and triggers coming where people were there, people were willing, people were responsive. The response of I'm fine would have gotten me nowhere. People would have just kept going, treating me however. But mm -hmm. I responded in courage and therefore it gave others the courage to respond to me in courage. How can yeah. I help? How can I support? What do you need? You see, that mm -hmm. is the challenge of humanity is giving our vulnerability so that others can respond in the greatest extent of their humanities too. It is a collective Absolutely. experience when Absolutely. we respond to each other with Absolutely. what we do. 
Yes. And so mm-hmm. honestly, that's honestly. how you answer that question. Yes. Thank you so much, Kadesh. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Because when we do have the courage to be honest, we'd be surprised how people are just willing to step in. Yes. They are. Mm-hmm. And, and that's and actually you. God responding through them for yeah. you too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Never, you never know when you're in the presence of angels. You have to give room for human beings to be human. You have to give room for 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 us to be vulnerable and loving and kind and empathetic with each other. Mm-hmm. When you walk around in the prison that you described earlier, when you walk around caged by your experiences, that's that same cage that prevents others from letting coming in. It's the yeah. same cage that is, you know, preventing others from helping you experience a breakthrough that may be necessary for your soul's healing. Yes. It is our desire to be connected in that way. It mm-hmm. is our desire to be connected with our human frailty and our vulnerability. But I tell you, the go, 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 the demands, mm-hmm. the pressures, the yeses, the everything I've got to do, the checklist, those are bars, one bar at a time that we put in front of ourselves. And before we know it, we've locked the cage and we've locked the keys and we've locked ourselves in to the state of, of you know, that keeps us away from being free. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it keeps does. Away from being free. Mm-hmm. And God is ready to liberate, ready to liberate. Yes. Our minds, bodies, soul, and spirit, yes. so that we can truly come into alignment with our well being and ourselves, right? Yes. Reconnect with ourselves. So, yes. thank you so much for um, this healing that you're bringing to all of us. Um, I encourage everyone to go ahead and dive in. Let's start this month with just a renewal. I feel a renewal through this, a renewal coming. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Agree. Agree. It's yes. a great way to start the year. <laughs> it is, right. It starts now, right? It starts yes. now with you. Yeah. Then we can step into our newness, right? Yes. <laughs> the yes. new, new thing, the new, new thing. God is doing something so new and beautiful. So yes. thank you for being a part of that. And thank you for joining me in this conversation. Thank you for having so me. Yes. 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 Thank you so um, much. Yes. All right. Let's continue to shift. See y'all yes. soon. Bye. See you shift. <laughs>